Bible, why don't you turn to Isaiah chapter 54, um, so Isaiah 54 verse 1 uh, to 5, and while you're turning there, let me just uh, explain what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. If you've been with us, uh, worshiping with us, gathering with us around God's Word, you'll know that we've been doing a series looking at discipleship, so we've covered the foundations of discipleship in January, uh, we've covered the, uh, our, our identity in Christ, understanding that throughout the month of February. But this month we're going to take a short break um, on it as we lead up to Easter um, uh, to look at what's being called the four Ps. Um, so prophecy, priorities, purpose, and pursuits, which were shared at the recent church meeting. And the idea is just to, to the things that I shared at the church meeting, just to ground this in God's Word um, and for us to think about it a bit more deeply, to begin to ask questions about what does this mean for me, how does this impact me, uh, uh, and that sort of thing. How does this impact us together as a church family as we move forward uh, together. And so it should prompt further thoughts. This will be followed up by emails and invitations for you to come and share. It's a two-way process where we can discuss and pray together, all the while leading up to uh, our June church meeting where we will together um, endorse this once we've been through this process of dialogue and asking questions uh, and that sort of thing. And we begin this morning with the prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward. So Isaiah chapter 54 verse 1 to 5 says the following, Sing, O barren woman, you who never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. What a great passage of Scripture. If it's not underlined in your Bible, I would encourage you to do so now, if you have a pen to hand, okay? so that this is highlighted in our minds. Now, I want to start off just by pointing out a, a fact just to fix it in our minds so that we're quite clear on this. God is always leading us somewhere. God is always leading us somewhere. All right? He's always taking us somewhere. For, for many people, I think you know, in regards to church, you may be thinking, well, this doesn't felt like it lately. You know, it, it just feels like the last 12 months we've been stuck in limbo. Now we start, now we stop, now we start, now we stop. And uh, we've been stuck in limbo. We've stagnated as a church. We're, we're kind of, maybe there's sort of steps taken backwards and that sort of thing. That's not true. I do not believe that that is true because Scripture tells us, God, I think Scripture affirms, God is always leading us somewhere. And Jesus himself said, my Father is always at work. I am always at work. Paul affirmed it in writing to the Romans that God is always at work in all circumstances bringing about His purposes. God is always leading us somewhere. And part of the, the role of the Old Testament prophets uh, in Old Testament scriptures was to point the way and the direction that God was leading the people. So for instance, if you, you, sometimes the prophets would come with a message of calling the people to repentance. Take for example the book of Amos. Amos was a, from the southern kingdom. He went up to the northern kingdom to preach to the northern kingdoms. The problem in the northern kingdoms was that the, the, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. There was terrible injustice and that sort of thing. And Amos goes to them and says to them, listen, you need to repent. Where God is leading you is to repentance. This is the message. These things are not good. God is not pleased with these things. You need to return to God. You need to repent. You need to. And as you repent and return to God, He will restore you. So God was seeking to lead them. He was speaking through his prophet, trying to lead his people to repentance. And of course, Amos warned. He said, look, if you don't, God will lift his hand of protection from you, and there will be judgment. And the people didn't listen. And so God's hand was lifted from them, and the Assyrians swept in and carried them all off into captivity. God is always leading us 
some way. But then on the, on the other hand, sometimes the message is one of restoration that the prophets bring. Sometimes it's a message of hope that the prophets bring. So sometimes the people were in captivity as they were in the, the, the Babylonian exile. And then the prophets were speaking a message of hope and saying, listen, this is, you're in captivity now and this is the reality of your circumstance, but God is still leading you somewhere. You, you're, you're not stuck in limbo. You're not stagnated. God is at work. He is bringing about His purposes. And here's a promise that says He's going to lead you forward. He will lead you out of captivity. Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. As God brings them out of Captivity. God is always leading us somewhere. And many of these passages of hope that we find in the Old Testament prophets that tell the people, listen, God is, you're in trouble now, but God is going to bring you to the spacious place. God is going to bless you and restore relationship with you. Many of those prophecies find their fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the church. And Isaiah 54 is an example of that. Isaiah 54 fits into that category. The fulfillment of Isaiah 54 comes through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the birth of the church. And so I guess in that sense, it has widespread application. I mean, it could apply to, to it does apply to all churches, but it has a particular resonance with us. It has a particular meaning to us. Those of you that have been around uh, long enough and those of you that haven't listening closely, uh, when Stuart Woodward was here as a minister, he was a former minister here at Kingswood Baptist and uh, a friend and, and mentor, he shared a prophetic word that the Lord, he sensed the Lord had given him for the church in which the leadership at the time endorsed and the church as a whole endorsed. And it surrounded four bullet points and a phrase. Uh, the bullet points were get your irrigation ditches sorted out, cleared out, sort out your priorities, get the channels of love and outreach cleared out, get your lifestyle sorted out, there's a rainstorm coming. And that word found its landing place or found its roots for us in Isaiah 54. And so whenever uh, Stuart wanted to remind us, and he was really good at doing this, of where it is that God was leading us, what it is that God had in store for us, he would always preach from this passage. If memory serves me correctly, I can remember at least two or three times on the first Sunday of each year, Isaiah 54 would be preached from, and he'd just tell us again, remember, this is where we're going. This is where we're going. And this is so important for us. I think this is somewhere where you know, I've stumbled, I think, previously, in, in previous years, where I haven't been bringing this, just a reminder. Just remember, this is where we're going. This is where we're going. Stuart used to say to me, you've got to keep talking about this stuff because it leaks. You've got to keep reminding people of the priorities because it leaks. You've got to keep reminding people of vision because it, it leaks. And, and it, it's important for us because we need to fix in this mind of where it is that God is leading us. He's always leading us somewhere. So we need to know where God is leading us because it helps us define the direction that we need to move, but it also hinders us from being passive consumers. If we've got a very clear idea in our mind of where it is that God is leading us, we can't just be passive consumers along for the ride. No, no, we have to be active contributors to this. We need to kind of put our shoulder to the wheel and get engaged with what it is that God is doing and where it is that He is leading us. It also, if it captures our imagination, that's why I said underline it in your Bible and go oh, back to it and pray over it and so on. If it captures our imagination as well, it gives us meaning. It gives us purpose. We're not just doing church, we're going somewhere as a church. Right? God's got a purpose for us. It helps us to make decisions. So if we know where it is we're going, everything along that path in the direction of where it is that we're going is fair game. We can engage with that. But if there's something over there, we say, people say, oh, we need to go and do this over there. Well, no, that's not within our scope. It doesn't fit within the direction that we're going. Why would we be doing this if this is the direction that we're going. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. And, and it generates resources as well. It generates resources. If we know where it is that we're going, if we have a clear understanding of this and our part within this, we'll be willing to give of our time and our energy and our financial resources to what it is, the work that God is doing. And so this month, we're, we're drawing ourselves back to this prophecy, this promise that beckons us forward just to fix it in our minds so that we have a clear understanding of where it is that God is leading us. And I think it's very timely. I think it's very timely because I think we can all acknowledge together that in some ways we've drifted a little bit. When I shared this at the 
church meeting, at the end of the church meeting, Nick Lear shared a really helpful picture. He, he said, you know, the, the, the goal is still the same in that sense. Nothing's changed. But we've been in a rowing boat, rowing in that direction. The goal's been behind us, but all sorts of different things have come along, COVID included, uh, amongst other things. And, and it's blown against us and knocked us off course. And now what we're doing is we're turning around and we're saying, whoa, hold on a second. We're moving in the wrong direction. We need to just alter our course a little bit. It's a change in direction. The goal still remains the same, but we're just altering our course so that we can move more intentionally and more purposefully into the things that God has in store for us. I think sometimes we haven't stewarded it well as people have come and gone in the church, uh, as new people have joined us to say, hey, this is what we're about. This is where we're going as a church. And by all means, join us. And if people say, well, I've got this idea, we'll say, as long as it fits in, it's on the same route to where, where we believe God is leading us for sure. But otherwise, it fits outside of our scope. It shouldn't be engaging in it. And so we need to steward this better. We need to be reminded of this better. We need to underline this passage, grapple with this, ask ourselves the question, what does this mean? It's the prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward, which I think if I could sum it up in one phrase, what does it mean for us? What does it mean of us? It means that we're a place to grow. That's the goal. We're, we're a place to grow. Not only in terms of making space, but in terms of our own lives we're a place to grow. And I want to fix our thoughts and from this passage, just to hug the contours of this passage really closely uh, this morning and arrange five thoughts which should hopefully be easy for us to remember as we continue to move forward and meditate upon this. So five thoughts about this as we think about this prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward, as we think about being a place to grow. This is where God is leading us. Five thoughts for us to concentrate on. Number one, the servant's work is done. Maybe you want to write that down. The servant's work is done. This is so important for us to grasp. You see, there is no enlarging our tent. There is no Isaiah 54 without Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. The danger is that sometimes we, we lift passages of Scripture out of their flow and context and read them in isolation without actually looking at what else is going on around. But here's the thing. There is no Isaiah 54 enlarging and singing of the barren woman, etc., etc., without Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. And you know the passage I'm talking about, right? Those of you that are doing, are doing Lent Bible studies as you run up to Easter, at some point, I'm sure you've already come across Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. It's the song of the suffering servant. We're going to read it at some point during Easter, I'm sure. But it is the most beautiful picture in the Old Testament of the substitutionary atoning work of Jesus. It is incredible. I don't think there is another Old Testament prophecy that points forward to the gospel story and the, the crucifixion more clearly than what Isaiah 53 does. It, it, every, all the ingredients are there for us. It talks about the human condition. Verse 6, we are all like sheep and we have gone astray. That's the Old Testament equivalent of Romans 3.23, which says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody escapes. Nobody kind of squeaks in because of good behavior. The bottom line is we've all strayed from God. We're all separated from God because of our sin. We're all deserving of death, which is the penalty for sin. We're all deserving to bear the wrath of God because of our sinfulness. But, <laughs> the great word, we're going to look at it again next week, but the door, that kind of, the word that swings open the door to possibility, but the servant of the Lord, the suffering servant comes, and he is pierced for our transgressions, and he is crushed for our iniquity, and the Lord lays our sin upon him. Is there no greater picture of substitutionary atonement than this? What we deserve, Jesus takes in our place. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He is the one who is led to the slaughter. He is the one who bears the sins of many, making intercession for the transgressors. It's Christ working on our behalf. That which we could not possibly do for ourselves, which Paul says in Ephesians 2, because we were dead and powerless in our sin, Christ is now done for us. And so through his sacrificial death, sin has been atoned for so that those who come in repentance, turning from their sin towards Christ, can be saved. 
Righteousness given to those who trust in Christ's life-giving sacrifice. Adopted as the children of God. And now all those truths that we looked at last month become into play, right? We're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people who are chosen, a people belonging to God, called out of darkness into His glorious light to declare His praise. We're children of God, servants of the Most High God, ambassadors of Christ Jesus, and, 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 because of the saving work of Jesus. It all starts with the gospel. It all flows from the gospel. It's a source. The gospel is the source of our life. There, there is no Isaiah 54 unless we're firmly planted and rooted and our lives are established in the gospel. We would be nowhere without, the Christ save, without Christ's saving work. Church would just be a club that we attended. And at this point, as you get to the end of Isaiah 53, 12, I think there should be a therefore. There isn't. I'm not about to add one. But it's helpful for me to think at this point, after you've read all of what there is to read, and I'd encourage you to go back and read 52.13 to 53.12. As you read all of that, at the end of it, it says, and made intercession for the transgressions. Therefore, point number two, sing, O barren woman, and shout for joy. Right? The only reason why the barren woman can sing and shout for joy is because of the servant's work. But now because of the servant's work, now the barren woman can sing and shout for joy. And I, I, We miss the symbolism and the significance of what's being said here. Because we, I don't think we fully grasp the shame and the stigma and the disgrace that was so often attached to barrenness in the Old Testament and in ancient Near Eastern times. If we read our Bible carefully, you'll pick it up. It's Rachel looking down at Joseph, who's just been born to her, and she's saying, God has taken away my disgrace. All these years I've been watching Leah give birth to baby after baby after baby, and I've been sitting here, now God has taken it's Hannah as she's before the tent of meeting in Shiloh and she's on her knees crying out to God because of her barrenness. And Eli looks at her and says, what are you doing getting drunk here before the Lord? And she's like, no, 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 I'm in distress. This is, that's what this is. I'm distressed. I've got, I'm carrying this, this grace, this stigma is around my neck. It's Elizabeth who feels perhaps John kicking in her womb. She's like, can't believe it. God's removed my disgrace and He's shown favor to me in this part of my life. But don't miss this. The command here to sing and sing for joy is not because, like Rachel, Hannah, and Elizabeth, their disgrace was removed and so the barren woman was now able to have children. No, no, no. The reason why they can sing and rejoice is because of the work of the servant. The woman's still barren. It doesn't say sing barren woman because now you have God children of your own. You're no longer barren. No, it's all because of the work of the servant. Because of his life-giving sacrifice, a way has been made for sons and daughters to be birthed. But not of a natural birth. Born from above. We're back to John chapter 3. John, John's, uh, Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. These children are all supernaturally born. Born from above by water and the Spirit. Back to Ezekiel chapter 36. They're gathered and they're cleansed and they're given a new heart and a new spirit. And you only have to pay careful attention to the text to be able to see that. This gathered family that the barren woman is rejoicing over it cannot be explained by natural causes because she's still barren. It cannot be explained by uh, the, 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 the husband and wife coming together even if she wasn't barren because the children are too numerous to be born to one family. No, this is the supernatural birth of the church. This is God's purpose. This is what we see in the book of Acts, isn't it? I mean, is the book of Acts not the clearest example of this? The gospel work is done by Christ. The Spirit of God is poured out on the day of Pentecost. And what happens? Sing, O barren woman, and rejoice. Why? Because your sons and daughters are growing. Too numerous to count. 3,000 baptized on the first day. And so they grow, and so they grow, and so they grow. An important thing for us to fix in our minds is that this is God's work. 
Right? This is God's work. What did Jesus say to, the, to, to his disciples? I will build my church. I will build my church. Some, sometimes I think we fall into, and I know I've done it myself in the past, I think sometimes we think it's, it's up to us. It's up to us to, to make it, to make it happen. We've got to make it happen. No, no, it's God's work. Through the gospel, God brings to life those who are dead in their sin. Number one, the servant's work is done. Number two, sing, O barren woman. Number three, make space. Enlarge the place of your tent. And again, the language here for us is incredibly significant, I think. Right, because it draws to us, it brings to mind an Old Testament symbolism when the, the people of, of Israel were taken out of captivity in Egypt and they went into the desert and wandered in the desert towards the promised land. But they were brought out of captivity to do what? To worship the Lord. And now they're set apart as an, for an exclusive fellowship with the Lord and they live in utter dependence upon Him as He provides for them food and their clothes don't wear out and He provides for them water and they're walking in close relation. I know with ups and downs, you know, but, but they're walking in close relationship with Him. And, and is that not the same for us again through the gospel? We're called out of darkness into His glorious light, set apart. That's what it means to be a saint. We're all saints if you're in Christ. Set apart for His purposes, to worship Him, to live in dependence upon Him, to live underneath His care. Supernatural growth taking place. Enlarge the place. And that promise, that, that, that command to enlarge the place of the tent, it rests on a promise. You will spread out. That's a conditional promise. I think it's conditioned on the fact that we are separated, so we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are seeking to grow in holiness. We are seeking the Lord's face. We are walking in humility with Him. But as we do this, God, God has promised to pour out His Spirit upon us, to fulfill His purpose among us. As we walk faithfully with Him in humility, and when the Spirit is poured out, everything changes. Everything changed. It's Isaiah 32, the beautiful, beautiful chapter. I love it. I think it's around... Isaiah describes the city is deserted and there's donkeys there and conies there and everything's overgrown and it's really run down until you get to verse 12. Till the Spirit is poured out. And like that, boom, everything changes. And the city becomes a dwelling place. It's a dwelling place of righteousness and justice and peace and love. And the field becomes fertile and the, the field becomes a plain and uh, then there's a forest that grows and just everything is harmonious. How? Because the Spirit of God is poured out. Isaiah 35 is another example. The desert and the parched land will be glad. Why? Because the Spirit of God has been poured out. Strengthen the feeble knees and the hands that are giving way. Say to those that are feeble, do not be afraid. God is coming. God is going to work. And there's a highway of holiness for us to walk on. It's just this beautiful picture of transformation that happens as the Spirit of God is poured out. Isaiah chapter 60, arise and shine, for your light has come. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But what do you say to his disciples? You are light. Don't hide your light underneath the bushel, underneath the thing. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shines upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you. Nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your dawn. What is that? That's Isaiah 54. The supernatural growth that happens as the people of God rise up in the fullness of the Spirit. Anchored by the word. Sustained by the gospel. Is it making sense? The servant's work is done. Sing, O barren woman. Enlarge the place of your tent or make space. Number four, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I think this is a really important one. Afraid of what, you wonder? Isaiah goes on, he, he, of shame, disgrace, humiliation. These are all the things that the people of God suffered as they were carried off into captivity. The southern kingdom, when the Babylonians came and 
conquered them and carried them off into captivity. These were the things that they suffered. Shame, disgrace, humiliation of a kind that we can scarcely bend our heads around. And that was the whole thing that they did. They just utterly humiliated the people that they conquered, the Babylonians did. And this is what the people have suffered. You only have to read the book of Lamentations to get a picture of what it might have been like. But now, again, the word, but now, transgressions and sin that resulted in shame and disgrace and humiliation, because that's what sin does to us. It results in shame, disgrace, and humiliation. It's been dealt with. It's no longer remembered. And the language that Isaiah uses here is from youth to widowhood. So he's saying, your whole life, your whole life, all those mistakes, all those transgressions, all the times that you have stumbled and fallen and been ashamed and felt guilty and humiliated, all of those things are remembered no more. Why? Because the suffering servant's work has now been done. See, it all keeps coming back to the gospel. And the command again here, do not be afraid, it rests on the assurance, the maker is your husband. What a great picture, right? The maker is your husband. God, through the suffering servant, has committed himself to those who turn to him in fullness of saving power. We need not fear because the Holy One, the Redeemer, is on our side. And he has redeemed us by the precious blood of Christ. He is God of all the earth and our all of life circumstances come under his sovereignty. And this is such a great word for us as a church at the moment. Because it might just be that you're thinking, does this still apply to us? I mean, who of us didn't feel shame? Didn't feel a sense of guilt? Didn't feel a sense of humiliation throughout December and January when we had to make the agonizing decision to allow the planning permission that we had been given for the building to lapse. I did. But God, I haven't stewarded this properly. Humiliation. Every time another pastor said to me, hey, Stu, how's the building project going? I had to explain where it is that we're at. And the sense of overwhelming grief and sadness. We finished that meeting on the 7th of January and I shut my computer down in my office next door. I sat for I'm not sure how long and just felt incredibly saddened and grieved that a gift from God that we had been given, which the planning permission I firmly believe was, had just been squandered. So what do you do? What do you do in this situation? I've got all these questions going. Maybe you wrestled with some of them as well. I've got all these questions going on in my mind. Have we blown it? Have we missed the boat? Have we, as a, as a people together, as the body of Christ here, has, has, has God's hand now moved on to somebody else? Does it mean that this is going to be for another generation to do? And then if that's the case, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as a church? What, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? What are we going to be about? And in that moment, Isaiah, this passage to verse 4 comes in and says, Don't be afraid. Yes, you've wondered. Yes, you've made a mistake. Yes, mistakes have been made. But there is always repentance. There's always a way back. And there's always a God who is our maker, who is our husband, the Holy One, our Redeemer, who stands ready to restore us. And so this word has powerful meaning for us. It says to us this morning, God's not done. He's not done with us as a faith family and the plans that He has for us. I refuse to believe that He is. And that which is true for us corporately, I wonder if it's true for some of us individually this morning as well. Where you feel covered in humiliation and shame and disgrace. And you're wondering, is God done with me? Is God finished with me? Does God still have a future for me in His purposes? Can, he still, can I still be used by God? This passage says, yes, there is shame. Yes, there is disgrace. Yes, there is humiliation. But there is also a way toward repentance. And again, it comes back to the work of the suffering servant. There is a gospel message that beckons us. There's a gospel message that lifts us. 
There's a gospel message that cleanses us and there's a gospel message that compels us and says, now go. God's not done with us. I refuse to believe that He is. This is the prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward. We're a place to grow. Not just in terms of stretching wide to make space for people, but also to grow for us. A place where we can grow up as disciples and mature as disciples and as followers of Jesus, who then go out and call others to come and be followers of Jesus. The servant's work is done. Sing, O barren woman. Make space. Do not be afraid. And here's where we come in. Enlarge, stretch, and strengthen. You see, everything so far that I've messaged, step one, uh, that I've um, highlighted, step one through to four, that's all God. That's all God's work. Uh, we haven't come into the story yet. So far, everything is what God has promised that He is going to do. He has provided Christ, our Savior, the suffering servant. He has put a song of joy into the barren woman's mouth because now there is supernatural birth taking place through the gospel. That's God's work. He gives the promise, you will spread out to the left and to the right. He makes it possible that we need not be afraid because He is our maker, our husband who betrothes us. Everything so far is God's work. But now He says, hey, do you, do you, want, to, do you want to join in? <laughs> so God extends a hand to us and says, do you want to join in? So here it is. Enlarge, stretch, and strengthen. Enlarge the place of your tent. We, we need to look at ways that we can enlarge. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like, but what I do see is that we're going to do it together. Because I do believe that we will learn from mistakes where perhaps there were a few trying to drive things forward. As we move forward from this, we're going to be together as a family. And if we're not going together as a family, we're not going. So we're going to need to kind of gather in a little bit closer. We're going to need to pray more together. Not the responsibility of a few, but the responsibility of everybody. We're going to need to give. We're going to need to share what God is saying to us. We're going to have to dialogue together as we discern what is it going to look like for us to enlarge the place of our tent. Will it be another big, bu a big building on, the, on stilts over the car park? I don't know. Will it mean moving stuff in here to make the space bigger? I don't know. Will it mean just increasing the amount of services that we have? I don't know. Will it mean finding another, another location to, to, to host services from that are live streamed? That's opened up all sorts of possibilities. I don't know, but together we're going to figure it out, right? Right? Together we're going to do this. That's the important part of this. Enlarge your place. Together. We're going to be in this together. Number two, stress. Stretch. How's God going to stretch you? How's God going to stretch you? I think the simplest way to explain this will be to link this to our pursuits, which we'll come up to in a couple of weeks' time. The lifestyle that we persistently seek. We're going to go after certain pursuits, but we're going to be stretched in these things. And so we're going to keep on asking ourselves, okay, as we're, as we're engaging, as we're moving in the direction that God is calling us. We're a place to grow, and that includes us. We want to grow. So how is God going to stretch us in that growth? How is God going to stretch us in word and worship and prayer so that we encounter His presence? Because we love to encounter the presence of God because it's an encounter with God that, that changes our hearts and renews our mind. How is it that we are going to be stretched to live a positive life balance so that we serve God from a place of rest? rather than a place of being frantically exhausted. And for some, that stretching, it's going to mean, just to give you an example so it makes sense, maybe you work 60 hours a week, and you're trying to tack faith onto the end of that. And God's going to say, do you mind if I stretch you? So how about we cut your hours down to 45? And the other 15 you spend with me, not doing work for me, you spend with me, with your family, if you have a family, but God, what about the, 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 the other 15 hours that I'm missing out on? Yeah, do you feel a stretch? Make sense? How is God going to stretch us to build relationships, deep relationships with people that encourage and strengthen and build up? How is God going to stretch us in our generosity so that we grow in, in giving, not just of our time and talents, but also financially? 
How's God going to stretch this? And so often we, we, we settle for 10%. And we say, well, 10% is what I'm going to give. That, that's my goal. I wonder where we get that figure from sometimes. Because it's the Old Testament, yes, there was a 10% tithe, but if you add in all the festivals and everything that went on top of that, I think it equates to about 27%. Now we're thinking, oh boy. But don't worry, because the New Testament says, no, give proportionately, sacrificially, generously, cheerfully. So how's God going to stretch you in your giving? How's God going to stretch you as a personal witness, being an ambassador for Christ? But isn't that the work of the church? Aren't, isn't the church supposed to do? You're the church. We're the church. You're an ambassador of Christ. Wherever you go, you carry the presence of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Filled with the Spirit of God, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is within you. So wherever you go, you're a personal witness for Christ. Wherever you go. Stretch. Do you feel it? Are you starting to feel the stretch? Do you see how this is going to impact us? All right. Uh, how is God going to stretch you in terms of living a life of sacrifice? To constantly asking yourself, where do I need to say no to myself in order to say a bigger yes to God? In other words, just basically, how am I growing and being transformed as a disciple? I mean, that's what it comes down to. Enlarge practically how we're going to make space for more people. Number two, stretch myself. How is God going to stretch me through His Word and by His Spirit? Number three, strengthen when we used to go camping as a, as a family, we would uh, go camping in Cornwall, often close to the coast and stuff. And you may know there's like lots of storms and stuff that will come in, and that's the height of summer. Um, so I would occasionally, every two or three days, I'd go around the tent, and I would check the guy ropes, and I would check the tent pegs. Why would I do that? To make sure that as the wind blew and stuff, the tent would stand firm and stand steady, and so on. So I'd strength, stretch it wide, I'd strengthen it. And we need to do the same. We need to strengthen one another as we walk in relationship together. This is all about being family that we looked at last year. All right? So that all of us are presented mature in Christ before the Lord Jesus. When the day comes. And that means practical stuff for us. It means you need to ask yourself, why am I not a part of a small group? Because this is where strengthening takes place. This is where encouragement can take place. This is where blessing can take place. So why are we not a part of a small group? Maybe in May you need to start thinking about where it is, which group you're going to sign up to. And start making that commitment now. Thank God I'm not just going to give you Sunday mornings. I'm going to take an evening in the week or maybe a Friday morning. And I'm going to join with brothers and sisters so that I can be strengthened in my faith. So that I can strengthen other people in their faith. So I can use my gifts to bless other people. And that together we would see your kingdom come. We need to put on the full armor of God and remind one another to do this. Right? The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the belt of truth, the feet fitted with the gospel message. Let's put it on. And then stand firm against whatever it is that comes against us. And all the while, we need to be strengthening our understanding of this promise and keep revisiting it again and again and again. This is where God is leading us. This is the prophecy, the promise that beckons us forward. We're a place to grow. We're a place to grow. God's not done with us yet. God's not done with you yet. Suffering servant's work is done. Sing, O barren woman. Make space. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Enlarge. Stretch. Strengthen. If you're wondering, I don't have the energy for that. Thank goodness that it is Christ that empowers us by His Spirit. Again, it all comes back to Him. It's His work. At work in us, his power at work in us, I mean.